Good morning. Yeah, last week, um, I kind of hammered you. I guess kind of wouldn't be the word I should use. I I hammered you pretty good because I don't want you to continue with this reputation of the church of being judgmental and gossiping and and hypocrites. I mean, the, the church has got this label on them right now, and it doesn't have to be that way. And and division comes into the church. And, you know, Satan used to kind of have to hide. Now it appears he's just right out in the open and nobody even sees him. So, you know, it it happens within, I wasn't so much talking about our church, our assembly, but the church. A lot of division and arguing about things they don't need to argue about. And I don't want you to be part of it. Mercy is actually holding back what you think somebody deserves. And this is where our our weapon, our mouth, just unleashes. We don't agree with somebody that's doing something in the church. You know, if every church is teaching that Jesus Christ is the way to eternal life, that Jesus is Lord, regardless of the rest of the stuff, why don't we just keep our mouth shut? Otherwise, you're going to cause division within the church. And it's not how the church is supposed to act. Today, I'm going to try to tell you how I think the church should act. This is, this is also something that it's, it's my opinion, and I believe we need different kinds of churches. Uh, the, the whole rituals and ceremonies and, and all that stuff, I'm not so sure God is concerned with whether we're doing these things just right, but he's concerned about your heart. And if you don't think somebody's taking communion enough or they don't do Advent or, my goodness, it's Easter and they didn't teach on Lent, but you see, if they're teaching that Jesus Christ is the only way, then the other stuff really doesn't matter. And God teaches each and every person when the time is right. We don't need to hammer everybody because we cause damage. We will actually cause damage to the wheat when we try to remove the tares. This is what I don't want you to do. But what I do want you to do is what it says to do. And there's so much things that we do that Jesus doesn't tell us to do. And this is where we kind of start to cause damage. Jesus doesn't tell us to take scripture and beat people over the heads with it. He doesn't tell us to take scripture and and make it your sole agenda and duty to fix someone. Instead, he says, if somebody's convicted that they should do this, leave them be, I'll take care of it later. This is the church. And there's a purpose for us getting together once in a while. Not once in a while, at least once a week. You know, and I don't preach that you have to be in church every week. The church is out there. We just get together here and renew and refresh and and share stories and uh, just a lot of different things. But one of the things that God and Jesus confirms is really pretty simple. A lot of people don't think this is. I'm going to read you some of this. It starts in Hosea where he says... I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want your burnt offerings. Old Testament scripture, maybe it's kind of a little confusing to some of you, but then Jesus in the New Testament confirms this again, and he says this, but go and learn what this means. Now this would be important, right? Jesus is saying it and it's in red. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Go and learn what this means. That would be important. Now he said it twice. Then it's also mentioned a third time in Matthew 12. It says, but you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not sacrifice. Okay, let's break this down, right? I just told you what mercy was. Mercy is actually holding back what you do deserve. And and we put this in our own mind and we say, oh man, I saw them do something and you know what? They deserve this and I'm going to let them have it. And it says right here in scripture that that you shouldn't be doing this and and, and I I should separate myself from you. Really? That doesn't wash with the love of Jesus Christ. He didn't shun anyone. In fact, he shunned more the people that thought they were doing it right than the people that were doing it wrong. Everybody that they thought was doing it just right, he rebuked. 
we take this too far. When actually, it's very simple. He desires mercy more than sacrifice. And I'm gonna use the word more, and I'll explain it in a minute. He desires mercy. That means to hold back what you think somebody deserves or what you know they deserve. And a lot of times, this is our mouth. This is the weapon. We're gonna whip out the weapon and we're gonna let them have it because they deserve it. They have hurt me, they've done things to me, and I can't, I can't take it anymore, I can't be with them anymore. And, and now we use words like toxic and stuff like this, right? And we're, gonna, we're just gonna shun ourselves from this and, and boy, I'm gonna let them have it. Mercy would be holding that back. Do you really need to do that? That's your desire. But God says, I desire mercy more than sacrifice. Now the sacrifice, it actually says not sacrifice. And we know this isn't quite right because it goes on to say more than sacrifice. So don't think there's a contradiction there. You just have to follow the, the logic here. Of course he wants sacrifice. But what he doesn't want is for you to be sacrificing things and doing it all right and not showing mercy. I want you to show mercy more then I want your sacrifice. Pretty easy logic, right? Keep your mouth shut. Don't cause divisions in family, churches, business. Now right is right. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you here to roll over and play dead. Actually, to be a warrior in a garden is better than to be a gardener in a war. And what that means is that you can be prepared. You can be ready. You can be a warrior. But you're, if you're in a garden, you don't have to use it. Can't we just stop this? Can't we just stop this grumbling and this arguing and about things that don't really matter, especially in the church? I've tried to do better. And yeah, my mind still the same thoughts as the rest of you. I'm, my thoughts are not good. But you know what? I can't control my mouth. We're supposed to show mercy. It's a simple thing. Hold back what you think they deserve. And you know what? God will take care of it later. I taught you that last week. It's not for you to have the privilege to, to go off on somebody just because you don't like what they're doing or you don't think that they're doing it right. Here's what you should actually be afraid of. In the third chapter of Revelation, Jesus is writing letters to the church. And I've preached about this a lot. And here's where it really ties into this. I know your works, and they are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were hot or cold. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. He's writing that to a church. What, what if, what if he, he wrote us a letter like that and said, you're just lukewarm? You're not, you're not completely cold, but you're nowhere near hot. What do you think he's asking of the church here? What do you think he wants? What, what is lukewarm to you? If I received a letter, got a letter right here. Jesus told this guy to write this and to bring it to me, and it says, you know, you're neither hot nor cold. And because you're neither, just because you're lukewarm, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Yikes. What would we do different if we received a letter like that? What, what would be your opinion? You see, now, now you're going you're gonna to use your weapon, right? Well, it's because you're not doing this, because you're not doing that, because you're not doing this. You don't do this right. You don't do that right. You got a dog in church, right? All these things. You would want all these things changed instead of asking someone to change their heart. You want to fix everybody else, but you don't want to be fixed because you don't think you need fixing. And because you don't think you need fixing, this is the common church these days, because you don't think you need fixing, you're going to tell everybody else how to do it. It's very damaging. It really is. Can we not just get together and worship God however we choose to do it? And he'll take care of it later. But because you're neither hot nor cold, he doesn't accept your praise and your worship going to vomit you out of his mouth. You can translate that however you want. But doesn't it make you a little nervous? So what is lukewarm? 
I'm going to let you all decide. You can think about it in your head and whether you're that or not. I want you to move. I want you to be so excited, praise and worship, that you can't help but to, to move. And not so much in here, but out there. This is hot. This is excitement. So let's go back to what Jesus says. Now, we, he, he called out a lukewarm church. They're lukewarm. He didn't like it. And he goes on to say in John 10:10, 10, 10, super important. The thief comes, I'm sorry, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what he's trying to do to the church. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have life, in, I'm sorry, life more abundantly. Some, some of your paraphrases and versions and stuff will say life to the full or life to the fullest, life in abundance. This, this is awesome. Don't we want this? Life in abundance. And we get it from doing what he asks us to do. This is what we all want. Life in abundance. I know there's a lot of people in here that can witness to that. And, and so I'm not going to be the only one to stand up here and, and tell you that I thought I was living that way and, and then certain things began to happen and I realized I was not doing things the way God wanted me to and I just was a mess and pretty soon I realized I was disobedient and, and now I have very little, but I have life to the fullest. I've never been this happy. I've never been this blessed. He also tells us this, um, Matthew 5, 13. I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are to be the salt of the earth. A lot of people have heard me talk about this before. Okay, let's talk about salt for a minute. I love salt. I am a salt freak. I will salt things before I ever even taste it. I just know it's not going to have enough salt for me. It, it, so, you know, maybe some of you can help me with this. It, it seasons. It, it gives, gives things some, some pizzazz, right? It, it gives it some, some zing. It, it enhances what I'm looking for, right? Um, I don't know what else, how else I can say that. This is salt. I'm a salt lover. So if you are to be the salt of the earth, you are supposed to have some spice in your life, some seasoning to the earth. You are supposed to have some zest. You are supposed to take something that's not so great and make it greater. You are to spice it up a little bit. That is the salt of the earth. Okay, so if you're cold, you're probably not using your salt, right? If you're lukewarm, eh, you got some salt, but you only use it once in a while, and not really when it needs to be used, right? Or if you use salt in abundance, well, don't do this to yourself, but it, it spices up life. Hot. You are now hot. You are the salt of the earth, and you are pouring this stuff out on the earth. You are the one that seasons it, that gives it the zing, that gives it the, the boom, gives it the flavor. I don't know what other use to, you, words to use. So what it does is it seasons things. It also does a lot more than that. First of all, it's a great preservative. And back in these times, what they would do is they would take their fish and their meat, and they would pack it in salt because it preserves Salt preserves things. If you are the salt of the earth, you are to preserve the goodness, preserve the faith, preserve the church. You are the salt of the earth. You are pouring seasoning out on it, and you're going to preserve it as well because you have more than one use. You know what else it does? It draws out bacteria. Bacteria would be the sin in our life. If you got salt and you got it in abundance, and you're seasoning the world, and you're preserving the faith, preserving the church, that same salt draws out impurities. It will draw out bacteria and things, even in a wound. 
I'm, I'm not a nurse. Is there any nurses in here? Did I just say that wrong? It draws out things. Uh, I have right here. Had a bad tooth once. It was infected. And I was gargling with salt water. Worked like a champ. I get that. You know what else it does? It puts out fire. Do you know that salt can actually put out a fire? Do you understand now what I'm talking about? It draws out impurities. It draws out bacteria. It draws out things in our life that shouldn't be there because the salt is so overwhelming. It's hot. You're hot now, and you, you're full of salty earth. How can you get the salt back? How can you get the saltiness back? How can you get the flavor back? The only way I can see to do it is to be bombarded with more salt. If you're losing your saltiness, and all of a sudden you are blended with a whole bunch of salt, you will be salty again. You will be useful. You will not be thrown out and trampled. And you have to understand what this is pertaining to, right? Thrown out, trampled underfoot. That is not eternal life. It's got a lot of great uses. And you are supposed to be it. It will draw out the enemy from within a church, within a family, within you. You are to be the salt of the earth. One other thing I want to touch base on is we're supposed to be childlike. I'm good at this. <laughs> I throw myself on the floor and yell at stores when Kelly won't buy me something. <laughs> right? I'm a great childlike preacher. I, I'll just admit it. But I don't think that's entirely what he's talking about here. Matthew 18, 3 and 4. Truly I tell you, unless you change... Remember that word. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I've got to put this in some context for you. The apostles were arguing about who was going to be the greatest or who was the greatest. And they actually would take, the children would want to come. You know, we have kids, where are river and rains when I need them? Right? The kids would come up here and the apostles would take him and pull him back and say, no, he's doing important stuff. You can't interrupt him. And he's saying, let them come to me. And he, and he takes one of them and he puts it on his lap. And he says this. He's actually talking about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he's using a child as an ana analogy. And, and what this does is you have to think about how much faith they have. They just are so simple and pure. And you know what else? They're teachable. You can change a child. If they're doing something wrong and you want to correct them, if you discipline them, you can change them. Try changing a 62-year-old man or a 30-year-old man or a 50-year-old man, right? There comes an age where, oh, no, 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 no. This is what I am and this is how I'm going to do it. But a child... They actually will take discipline. They will take correction. They will take direction. They know they're not the best in the world. They know that us, as, as mature adults, have authority over them. Now, some of them don't quite do the authority the way they, I don't know why I'm looking at you. They change. We don't. If we all were more childlike, if we could take direction, if we could take correction, this is what he's talking about. Childlike faith. Just believe. Don't need to know all the answers. You can change. You must change to be childlike. That means you're not now. So what do you have to do? You have to be able to take direction. You have to be able to be corrected. This is what it means to be childlike. And I actually saw the church this week. I, I saw the church this week. I saw the church that I want to be part of this week. I really did. And none of you were there. I'm sorry to say that. Well, maybe a few of you were. We had this VBS this week. And this is the church. This is hot. 
This is the salt of the earth. These kids were running around, having the best time. They heard the word of Jesus. 61 kids heard the word of Jesus. Right? This is what it's about. And, and in this time, in the, in the time surrounding their little lessons and, and, and stuff like that, learning what discipline was and, and getting in the habit of meeting together, they had fun. They were excited, so excited for VBS. Church. I never was that excited about church. They are, oh my goodness. Oh, it was loud too. It, it was real loud. And I'm not the best at this. I'll admit, I can't run around and play with them and stuff. If I get on the floor, it's going to take three of you to help me get back up. But I tried, and I don't know half of these kids. And they're running up to me and grabbing my leg. Pastor Glenn, who is this? I don't, well, how do they know who I am? Right? There was just, there was just goodness. There was goodness everywhere. This is what I saw. I saw them be in a habit of meeting together. I saw them have patience. I saw them take discipline. I saw people meeting the needs of other people. We had a, well, we had a crisis here. We ran out of rice. They were filling rice with one of these craft things. You see, in the craft room, they were taking direction. They ran out of rice. And my goodness, it's like uh, the earth was coming to an end. You know, Tammy jumped in her car and ran to the store, tried to buy all the rice they had. I think Laura called her mother and said, you got any rice? Get, get somebody else. Get some rice. you got to need rice. And, and I was supposed to go outside and wait for the rice. I'm standing out there waiting for the rice. You know what? We got rice. Oh, we got a lot of rice. That's the church. That's exactly what the church is. In the craft room, I saw them use their talents. I saw the food ladies serving childlike church people. I saw worship leaders worshiping and leading. I saw kids that didn't have any fear. They weren't nervous. You ever seen the confidence of a four-year-old in a Batman shirt with a cape? That's the kind of confidence they had. He can do anything. I'm Batman. <laughs> Dude, get over there and do it. I'm Batman. Why aren't we acting like that? That's the church. They helped kids up the slide, down the slide. Nobody was better than anybody else. That was huge. Yep, they fell and got their knees hurt and their elbows scraped and everybody ran to him to help him. That's the church. We had a nurse on duty. And she would go, get him band-aids and stuff. The other kids were concerned. This is the church, right? This girl used her talent to be the nurse. I mean, she's actually a nurse. To fix boo-boos. And you know what? It was for a short season. And it wasn't, but just a few minutes later, they were right back running with the rest of them. That's how your troubles should be. A short season. That's the church. People set up and tore down. I think I was the only one that was grumbling. Nobody else. They just had a blast. And I can't help but to thank you. When you understand what Jesus did for you, Jesus died for you, so you didn't have to take that torment. Is this not the best thing ever? If you won the lottery, you'd tell everybody, but you get your life saved from eternal torment in hell by the blood of somebody else, and you're just going to stand there and... Thank you. This is, this is shouting stuff. Firemen rush in, save your life. Oh, you're all over them, hugging them and stuff. This is great. They saved my life. I for, will forever be in debt to you. But when you think about Christ doing it, you just sit there. We're going to sing some songs today. We're going to go to church, and we're going to worship God. I get that. Reverence. You're in awe. Awe-struck reverence of the Lord. Me? I'm excited. I know where I was headed, and I know what I deserve. 
And when I changed and became more like a child, I got it, man. And you should too. Church should be fun. Church should be exciting. We should get together and renew. We should pray together. That's what they did. We should break bread together. That's what they did. We should lift one another up. That's what they did. We should encourage one another. That's what they did. We should help one another. That's what they did. That was the church. And it was full of life. It was life in abundance. Don't you want that? So when this happens to you, when you change, when you get it, when you understand what's happening to you, you have no way to stop this excitement that should come over you. And you can let it go. You really can. We made this video, and I want you to experience what the church is, how the church should be. Yes, there's time for prayer. There's time for, for food. There's time to meet each other's needs. There's seasons of hurt, and then they're right back healed again, right back in life, life in abundance. I just want you to watch this, and I know that you're going to wish you were there. That's the church. That's the church. And that's the way we should be acting. Yep, I went down the slide. I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> right? But I liked it. It was fun. 
It was fun playing the games, doing the slides, whatever it was, it was fun. Everybody was excited and we were all together for the same reason, for the same purpose. That's the church. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. You understand how the church is supposed to be? This love that we're supposed to have for one another, it's not some mushy, lovey feeling. It's a bunch of kids getting together, and when somebody scrapes their knee, they put a Band-Aid on it, brush it off, and go back to having fun. It's just a short season. That's the church. They have fun together. Nobody was cutting each other down. Nobody was hurting one another. Nobody cared what size you were, what color you were. Whether you were smart or whether you were dumb, they just had fun. It was the church. They were doing every aspect of the church. And we should be too. Yes, if you want to worship in complete silence in your prayer closet, that is fine. But when you're out there, you need to be in the church. And this is what the church is supposed to be. Life in abundance. Life to the full complete life and that's the kind of fun you have so what we're going to do is we're just going to take a minute and think about this and we're going to try to have some fun now you see i'm thinking about making a craft and making you uh memorize a bible verse and you know all the things that they did over there we could do in here right because then maybe you'd act more like the church maybe i'm doing it all wrong maybe kelly's got it right this is what we need to do. We'll break up into groups and make our little craft. And they had glitter all over me. I was glitter. I'm still finding glitter. It's okay. It's actually fun. I pulled off a sock last night and there's glitter on it. I'm like, it's cool, man. Used to be when I came home, if you had glitter on, your wife wondered where you were, right? <laughs> Not anymore. We go to Simply Free Church. Now, I'd bomb you all with glitter right now, but I know you'd get mad at what's called as the division in this church because you wouldn't think it'd be the right thing to do. It sticks around for a long time. Yeah, we gave uh, airbrush tattoos and we had laser tag. And you know what? That's what got them here so they could hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And if that's what it takes to get you to hear that same news, I'll do it. We praise and we worship when we're excited. How can you not? Keep this inside, or how can you keep this inside? Jesus hung on a cross for you. He bled for you so you didn't have to. This is the greatest news ever. It's called the good news. It's the best thing ever. We shouldn't just keep this inside of us. We shouldn't just, just sit there and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. You should be on your feet, jumping up and down, best you can. Be careful with that. That's the church, and I witnessed that today, right here, just the way it should be, just like those kids did all week long, and I don't want us to ever forget it. If it's not for you, no problem. That's why we have different churches. But boy, I want you to have some excitement, because this is the greatest thing ever. Jesus died for you, and if you're just going to keep this inside of you, I wonder whether you're really childlike, because when something great happens to a child, you know what happens. Can you? That is worshiping God. That's how we do it here. And that's how we're gonna to continue to do it with some excitement and some fun. If he walked in here right now, I don't want him to have to brush the dust off somebody. I want you guys to be moving so much that dust will never fall on you. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you for giving us life in abundance. Thank you for giving us life to the fullest. You're the only way we can get that. And when we recognize that, help us to just let it go. Because it is so fun. It is so pleasing. It is so comfortable. It's so joyful. It's so peaceful. 
And we don't have to have this facade because children, when they get something, they are excited. And that's exactly how I want to worship you. It's in your son's beautiful name we praise him. Amen.